It's the middle of the night, June 10th, 2015. A vicious and bizarre murder is about to occur in the innocent, sleepy town of Springfield, Missouri. A killer has come here on a mission to not just take a life, but to do it with a brutality that the sheriff's department will later say they have never seen before. A woman, a mother, in fact, a single mother who had come to be regarded as a local hero for the sacrifices she continually made for her chronically and terminally ill daughter is going to be gruesomely killed while she lay sleeping in her bed. A woman who has not one enemy in the world is going to die. And despite having no enemies, no valuables, and no money to steal, this attack was not random. This was not a burglary gone bad. This killer had traveled a great distance to murder this specific woman. Now, this may be an everyday occurrence in Chicago, New York City, Miami, other places, but not here, not in Springfield. Now, together, you and I are going to deconstruct and analyze one of the most bizarre, layered, and befuddling murder cases in modern times. We're going to unpack this case based on facts, based on what may have been hidden at the time but has since come to light. And when I say facts, I mean police reports, crime scene investigator findings, court documents, forensic and psychological workups, and most importantly, interviews that I myself conducted with the key players still alive in this deadly drama. I intend to take you inside the heads of everyone that played a part in this bizarre murder. Bizarre not just because of who carried out this horrific crime, but more importantly, why? The why has always fascinated me. What goes on in the mind of a killer? What goes on in their mind leading up to the murder? How do they make setting upon someone and snatching the life right out of them okay? Are they sick, twisted, amoral? And what goes through their mind at the split second they act? And who do they drag into the tragedy with them? The scope and range of complicit parties in this case is mind-boggling ranging all the way to government agencies almost at every level. A multi-state fraud scheme will be unveiled. Dark family secrets are going to come to center stage. A twisted tale of one of the most sadistic and cruel cases of barbaric torture and child abuse, neglect, and systemic breakdown ever imaginable is going to come to light. And I should warn you, I predict as this all unfolds, your most basic core values, what you thought you believed about right and wrong, may be shaken and challenged. Everything is tied to the facts. Everything is tied to documentation of the case. And I'm looking at it through the eyes, having been trained as a forensic psychologist, having spent my life in the litigation arena. And trust me, just when I think I've seen it all, a case like this comes along and you could not make this stuff up. As I said earlier, this killer, this maniac, was not from Springfield. He came in from out of town and arrived under the cover of darkness, stealthily stalking the streets of this sleepy Springfield suburb. He's on a sick, demented mission for a victim who will quench his thirst for blood. He is a killer, but he is so much more. This monster is the embodiment of evil. He walks down the dead-end street in a quiet neighborhood, casting his evil eye on each house he passes by. Which house will he choose? Which house is he looking for? And why? Why? How does he know this woman? He doesn't even live in the state, and she hasn't been more than probably 10 miles from home since she moved to Springfield. This woman, like you and I, she peacefully went about getting ready for bed just a few hours ago, brushing her teeth, putting on something comfortable, getting her bed ready. 
and slipping off to a sleep that you can imagine a single mother of a terminally ill child with multiple diseases to manage would probably welcome at the end of a long day. And as she pulls those covers up around her neck, as she closes her eyes, she has no clue that she will never see the morning light. Never smell the aroma of morning coffee. She has no clue that it will all end tonight. Her executioner is standing in the shadows. He's standing on her front porch. She lives in the seventh house. And that's where he stopped. He's inside that house in the blink of an eye, completely undetected by this tired mother. He moves almost as though he strangely has a sense of precisely where to go. And once inside that room, he's over her like a dark shadow. And with the slash of his knife, he turns that seventh house on the sleepy suburban street into a house of horrors. Breaking this morning, authorities are investigating a homicide just north of Springfield. The moment sheriff's deputies enter the modest home, the stale smell of death overcomes them. It's the unmistakable odor of a dead body. With their guns drawn, the deputies carefully walk inch by inch through the living room, past the kitchen, following a trail of blood leading to the bedroom. They cautiously crack open the door, their guns cocked and ready. They don't know what they're going to find. But when they look on the bed, they see the body of an obese, middle-aged woman lying face down. She's drenched in blood. The scene screams violence. The normally unfazed deputies are stunned. They're shaken by the sheer brutality of the murder. They would later say that they had never seen anything like it before. A murder this grisly just had never happened in Springfield, Missouri. Until now. The killing was savage, vicious, and fierce. This woman's white shirt, her pink sheets, her calico-covered pillows are all caked with dried blood. She had apparently been dead for several days. And she had been stabbed many times. It would be much later before the medical examiner could determine it was actually 17 separate stab wounds. But for now, for these officers, it just looked like a scene from the Hitchcock film Psycho. Police reports say this mad slasher must have surprised her while she was fast asleep. Pathologist reports indicated the first plunge of the serrated knife was buried deep into her back. It had to both shock her awake and incapacitate her at the same time. Terrorized, she screams out in excruciating pain and then cries out for her daughter, Gypsy, Gypsy, help me. Then according to the medical examiner, the second plunge of the knife slices straight into her neck. Her blood-curdling screams echo off the walls, help me, help me, Gypsy, Gypsy. The third thrust of the knife gets caught up in her lungs. The killer had to forcefully yank it out. The sharp teeth of the cold steel blade rips her flesh, splashing pints of blood onto the bed, the walls, and even the ceiling. She's now too weak to fight off the savage monster. Her screams are now but a faint whisper. She's begging for mercy. His prey subdued, the predator goes in for the kill stabbing again and again and again and again. And as the 17th plunge of the knife slices into her battered body, there is silence. Bitter death has closed her eyes forever. Didi Blanchard, mother of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, was dead. And she hadn't just been killed. She had been overkilled. This was personal. This was vengeance. This was unbridled, off-the-chain rage. But why? 
And where was this wheelchair-bound, chronically ill, terminal girl? She had just disappeared into thin air. Panic gripped Springfield, Missouri. You're listening to The Killer Thorn of Gypsy Rose, Analysis of Murder by Dr. Phil. I promised you at the beginning that I wasn't just going to tell you a story. I wasn't just going to report on a crime. I told you that I was going to analyze this. I was going to unpack it. I was going to break it down for you from a psychological perspective, from a forensic psychological perspective, and take you inside the minds of each and every player involved in this tragic drama. The one person I didn't speak to was Dee Dee Blanchard. But you are going to hear from her because she was, as I said, a bit of a hero in Springfield, Missouri. So she had been on television, and you're going to get a chance to hear some of her thoughts. What I'm interested in, from her perspective, is what thoughts go through someone's mind, not just when they're dying, but when they're being killed. In her last moments on Earth... Dee Dee Blanchard's final thoughts surely must have been about her young daughter, Gypsy Rose. These two were inseparable, and Gypsy's paralyzed in a wheelchair. She's fighting cancer. She's fighting many diseases. She is totally dependent on her mother. Her mother had to be thinking, if I'm leaving this earth... What's going to happen to my daughter? There's no one to take care of her. Who would take care of this little girl after she's gone? When homicide detectives pull the bloodstained sheets away from Dee Dee's lifeless body, they instantly realize this is not a random attack. This is targeted. It's payback. But payback for what? Why would anyone kill Dee Dee? The murder makes little sense because all the neighbors loved and admired Dee Dee and Gypsy Rose. They were well known for their courage in battling Gypsy's numerous illnesses. The murder investigation began with what would have normally been a routine radio call. Sheriff's deputies were dispatched to Dee Dee's house on a wellness check. And believe me, that kind of thing happens all the time. But this time was different. A couple of Dee Dee's friends alerted the sheriff after they saw a mysterious and vulgar post on the Facebook page Dee Dee and Gypsy share. Now let me warn you, the post is very graphic. It said... I effing slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet, innocent daughter. Now, when two friends saw the post, they thought the coarse language was very uncharacteristic of Dee Dee. She never talked like that. She never cursed online. They first thought, well, maybe she's commenting on some kind of horror movie. But again, because they had never heard her use that harsh language... They just don't think that's the case. They can't make sense of it. So now they believe that maybe someone has hacked into her Facebook page. But who? Who other than her very close friends even know that Dee Dee and Gypsy have a Facebook page? And if they knew it, how would they get access to it? I mean, everything has a password, right? Then, just a very few minutes later, an even more chilling message was posted. And that's when the friends realized something was horribly wrong. Let me warn you, this post was graphic as well. It said, Her scream was so effing loud, LOL. This sent chills down their spine. I want you to make a mental note here. 
because these Facebook posts will prove to be very important in the investigation of this case, not only in helping to solve it, but it also speaks volumes about the psychological makeup of the culprits. Now, once the friends see these two posts, they immediately call Dee Dee on the phone. There's no answer. Worried, they drop what they're doing and they run to her house. No one answers the door. They try to peer into the windows, but they're covered with a thick protective film, making it impossible to see inside. Now, they immediately dismiss the idea that Dee Dee and Gypsy took a, an unannounced visit to see the doctor or just are gone on an outing because the specially modified car that holds Gypsy's wheelchair is still parked in the driveway. They can't go anywhere without that car. Now they're really worried. So they call 911. 911, what's your emergency? Now deputies quickly arrive. I mean, they're there in minutes, but they cannot lawfully enter the house until they obtain a search warrant. And as they're waiting for the warrant to be issued, one of the friends in the neighborhood volunteers to crawl through a tiny window and look inside for signs of life. Now, he's in the house for less than just a few minutes. You know he had to have smelled the body decomposing. But he is quick back out that window because he is really unsettled. And he tells deputies he saw Gypsy's two wheelchairs, the only two she has, inside. The friend is now doubly concerned because he's never seen Gypsy without her wheelchair. Now, after some anxious hours of waiting, and yeah, I said hours, the search warrant is finally in hand. They sat out in front of that house for hours. Who knows what's going on behind those doors? But they sit outside because nobody answers and they don't have a legal right to go inside. Once they have the warrant, the front door's locked, so deputies bust it down. That's when they find Dee Dee's body in the bedroom. And in those few seconds, this once quiet neighborhood is now a major crime scene, now a national story. Sheriff's deputies seal off the house and surround the yard with yellow caution tape and begin the grim task of processing the evidence. But the CSI team quickly notices two key things are missing. First, where is the murder weapon? Now, remember, the deputies saw a trail of blood leading from the bedroom to the kitchen, and they find bloody paper towels in the kitchen trash can. Now, again, make note here because this is a major psychological clue. Who savagely hacks someone to death in their sleep, splattering blood everywhere, and then tidies up around the place with paper towels and throws them away in the wastebasket in the kitchen at the crime scene? Not very careful or thoughtful. But on the other hand, the bloody knife isn't anywhere in the house. And second, and much more important, where is Gypsy Rose? She couldn't have just run away to save herself, not without her wheelchair. She's the only witness to the murder, and she is nowhere to be found. Headquarters issues an all-points bulletin for Gypsy's safe return. But with no description of the suspects, it's impossible at this time to know who deputies are looking for. Detectives are working on the assumption that Gypsy is still alive because how would anyone outside her close circle of friends have known about the Facebook page she shares with her mother? They theorize optimistically that her abductors have kept her alive and are forcing her to give them the password so they could post on the Facebook page. But why, why, why would they even want to do that? 
The psychology of this killer is breaking all the molds. Who commits this kind of a murder, gets away, and then wants to start posting about it on the victim's social media accounts? Now, this killer is unconventional, motivated by something not yet figured out, and that is scary to say the least. Because when you are dealing with somebody unconventional, that means they're unpredictable. Now, based on the savagery of the attack, the Springfield Sheriff Department assume that this is a male and are majorly concerned that he or they have Gypsy Rose. Outside the perimeter of the yellow crime scene tape, neighbors are gathering, shocked and scared out of their wits. Here's what two women in her neighborhood have to say. It's shocking, but I never get to talk to Dee again. She was just an amazing person. She was always had a smile, a kind word for everybody. Listening to those neighbors with a psychological ear, I hear two things. Number one, Dee Dee and Gypsy Rose truly did have a positive regard from the people in the neighborhood, the people in the town. They were cared about because these people are truly grieving Dee Dee's loss. We don't live where we live by accident. We gravitate to places that we feel comfortable, that we feel safe. And every community has a collective consciousness and it seeks its own level of safety, comfort, predictability. And when somebody or something comes along and disrupts that, creates chaos, your whole life becomes unpredictable. It becomes scary. And imagine these neighbors. I mean, one day things are calm, they're predictable, they feel safe, maybe don't even lock their doors. And the next day, someone is viciously stabbed to death not 200 feet from their front door and has not been caught. Is there a killer on the loose? Are they at risk? And now this little girl has gone missing. This young teen is gone. Are their children at risk? So they're mourning Dee Dee. They're worrying about Gypsy. And they're wondering if a predator is on the loose. People do not feel safe in their own homes. Feelings, emotions are chaotic right now. Why would he kill Dee Dee and not the witness to the murder? Did Gypsy witness the murder? Did she see the murderer's face? And if so, why not kill her as well, as horrible as that would be? And what terrible things could be happening to this sweet young woman who spent her whole life battling a laundry list of ailments? Leukemia, epileptic seizures, muscular dystrophy, cancer, just to name a few. What kind of deranged individual kidnaps a disabled young woman said to be fighting a terminal disease? Everybody fears for Gypsy Rose. They fear that she certainly won't survive for long without her wheelchair and without her medicines. Now, no one thought for a single moment that Gypsy Rose, paralyzed from the waist down, was the knife-wielding maniac. She's too frail. She's too delicate. And the attack on her mother was too violent and savage. She just didn't have the ability to do that. I speculated earlier about what was going through Dee Dee's mind at the moment of her death because she and her daughter were inseparable. What's going to happen to Gypsy Rose? Is she still alive? And if she is, she's without her wheelchair. She's fed through a feeding tube. This is a young woman that simply cannot survive if not taken care of by someone with skills. So let me just take a minute and tell you a little bit about where Dee Dee and Gypsy lived. Now, Springfield, Missouri is in the heart of the beautiful Ozarks, and it is the buckle of the Bible Belt. Here, church and family values are paramount, and neighbors are always ready to lend a helping hand to someone in need. It's amazing. It's amazing the outpouring of love and support 
That's Dee Dee talking about how the Springfield community welcomed her and Gypsy with open arms, helping them unconditionally when they needed it the most. It's Mayberry. We're moving to Mayberry. <laughs> Dee Dee and Gypsy were many celebrities in Springfield. People considered Dee Dee a hero. She was the always devoted caregiver who selflessly took care of her sick daughter against all odds. They moved to Springfield after their escape from the ravages of Hurricane Katrina. Dee Dee and Gypsy were then living in a New Orleans suburb near the Gulf Coast when the massive storm made landfall. Gypsy and Dee Dee lost everything but their lives. Dee Dee said in an instant their apartment building was just completely demolished. Their car swept to the sea with the storm surge and all of Gypsy's important childhood medical records gone, gone with the wind. Gypsy recalls how she and her mom hunkered down and rode out the 175 mile an hour gust in their tiny apartment. She blindfolded me, but I looked and I still have nightmares of what I saw. But for Gypsy, the real nightmare is the one that never ends. It's her constant battle fighting her multiple illnesses. In order to fully comprehend what Gypsy has been dealing with all of her life, I need to take you back to the time before she was born and tell you about how her mother met her father. Dee Dee grew up in Chack Bay, Louisiana. It's a small burg on the bayou about an hour outside New Orleans. Her given name was Claudinea Petrie, but everyone just called her Dee Dee. Now, after high school, Dee Dee enrolled in nursing school where she was trained as a nurse's aide. This will be important later. She landed a job helping registered nurses and physicians in the hospital. Now, one night after her shift, Dee Dee drove up to New Orleans and met a man who would change her life forever. Rod Blanchard. I met Dee Dee uh, at a bowling alley one night, was, was out, I was about uh, 17 years old. Saw her, she was, she was there at the bar with a friend and she looked a little different, you know, she was dressed different. I, looked, I thought she might have been from out of town or something, so I, I approached her and asked her, I said, hey, where are, you, where are you from? You know, you don't look like you're from down here or nothing. So we kind of met like that, started talking, I bought her a drink, we, we hung out that night and started dating from there. I thought she was pretty cool, she was pretty different. She wasn't like the girls from down here. We dated for three months. She had a car, I didn't have a vehicle, so she kind of drove me around. Dee Dee was 24 when she started dating 17-year-old Rod. Yeah, you heard right. He was only 17. But in the city that care forgot, no one seemed to care that Rod was underage, and neither did he. Rod was really smitten with Dee Dee. He worked on a fishing boat, and he fell hook, line, and sinker for the woman from the bayou. He said everything was going great. That is, until... Came in from the shrimp boat. She said, you know, I need to talk to you. I'm pregnant. I was like, wow, really? I said, you told anybody? She said, no, not yet. I said, well, you know, I said, I guess we'll have to get married, you know? I mean, it was just, that's how I was raised. That's what you do. I felt like that was the right thing to do. She wasn't a terrible person. I wasn't really in love with her, madly in love with her. So I said, well, you know, she's a good girl. She's got a good family. I said, I'll eventually you know, learn to love her more and, and stick it out and do the right thing, but it uh, kind of didn't work out that way. You know, we were married three months. Rod says when it sunk in that he was about to become a teen dad, well, he was spooked. I woke up on my 18th birthday. I just felt like, what am I doing here? I don't, you know, and uh, I made the decision that morning to, that, that, you know, I need to, to get out of here. I, I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel like it felt right. You know, I know I was going to be the father to a, a child, but I could still do that and not have to sacrifice my whole, my whole life. And, you know, I had, had so much ahead of me to, to look forward to that I felt like it was a big step. I made the wrong choice. So I, I just left. You know, she, she was upset about it. She, she was, uh, you know, she, she woke up and she wasn't happy. Yes, it kind of went downhill from there, you know. But it was too late to turn back the clock. Dee Dee's baby bump was growing with every tick of the baby's heart. Rod says he just wasn't cut out to be a 17-year-old married father-to-be. 
and he says he wasn't ready for the enormous responsibility that comes with the territory, he skipped out. He abandoned Dee Dee and their unborn child. But Rod says his attitude toward fatherhood changed dramatically when Dee Dee gave birth to a baby girl, albeit a little prematurely. Actually, in Grand Isle Tarpon Rodeo, got a call from my mom the next morning saying, you know, you know, Gypsy was born this morning. So we, let, we left Grand Isle, came up the road, went, went to see her in the hospital and everything. Uh, did what I could for, for Dee Dee. And she was born perfectly healthy. Rod says although he ran like a coward at first, the moment he saw his daughter's face, everything changed. He was happy and proud to be her father. They named her Gypsy Rose after Gypsy Rose Lee, the infamous strip tease artist of the 20th century. Don't ask me why, they just did. Despite Gypsy's premature birth, she seemed healthy. She seemed strong. And oh, so adorable. Such a cute baby girl, a real stunner in the making. Doe-eyed with thick brown hair and a turned-up nose, who wouldn't love this child? But Rod said the happiness of a healthy newborn baby girl quickly came crashing down. About three months old, Didi told me that she started having seizures and she would stop breathing in her sleep, so she had her in for a sleep apnea test. And as far as I know from the medical records I've, I've seen now, that, that there was no determination that she was... She had sleep apnea, you know, her tests seemed pretty normal, but Dee Dee was persistent that she get a uh, heart monitor that she would wear at night. Rod tells me the sleep apnea was the first red flag of many red flags he would have. Now, I want to talk to you about a concept that I pay a lot of attention to from a forensic psychological standpoint. It's what I call accident enabling factors. And when I talk about accident enabling factors, I use accident very broadly. You can substitute in the word mishap, tragedy, crash, whatever. I'm talking about when bad things happen, there are enabling factors at play. And I mean, if something bad has occurred, an airline crash, a car crash, a building fire, if you start breaking this down and analyzing the human factors involved, think about it as links in a chain. And the last link is the tragedy. Well, what was the link before? and the link before that, and you will get back until you find the first link in the chain. And then when you start analyzing how each link fits together, you're going to find out that along the way, somebody had to do something they should not have done or failed to do something they should have done that allowed the tragedy to occur. I call it the but-for test. Now, I want you to put this in your vocabulary as we move through this case. The but-for test. But for someone doing something they shouldn't have done or failing to do something they should have done, could this tragic outcome have occurred? But for Rod ignoring Dee Dee's report of sleep apnea at three months old, we might be in a very different place today. As we unpack this crime, I'm just asking you to pay attention to what people did or failed to do that may have contributed to this tragedy. This young father didn't trust his inner voice when something seemed illogical. And that might well have been the first rock in an avalanche that would wind up ruining more lives than you can imagine. So just remember this moment. 
Rod says he was so concerned about Gypsy's breathing that he moved back in with Dee Dee and tried to make the marriage work. But he says their attempt at reconciliation failed and they divorced a few months later. That didn't work out. I didn't feel any different. The uh, relationship just it did a 180 and we started fighting. Well, not, not fighting. We didn't fight a lot. But, I mean, she kind of hounded me down and was taking me back and forth to court for, for child support after she was born and everything. I tried supporting her financially the best I could, which I guess to her, it's still, still, it's never enough, you know. So she was taking me to court for, for additional medical bills that she was accumulating. Take me to court with the thousands and thousands of dollars of, of receipts for Gypsy, which, you know, the court ordered that I, I'll be obligated to provide, you know, the medical insurance and, and all uh, medical expenses on top of child support and alimony. So uh, I don't know if, you know, Didi may be seeing that as, as a way to, to get an edge on top of me or, you know, s some extra money she can get. Rod says as Gypsy grew, her health continued to decline and the medical bills increased. Imagine how difficult it must have been for Rod to see this daughter, this one that inspired him to become a father instead of an absent father. Imagine how he felt watching his daughter falling apart day by day. He had to feel helpless in one sense because he couldn't do anything about it. He worked on a fishing boat. He didn't have any expertise in this, and he had married essentially a mother figure. Let's think about this. He's 17, she's 24. That's seven years difference. He's not particularly well educated, and she has gone to at least some college, and we're now dealing with a child that has medical issues, and what was her college training in? Medicine. Naturally, he's going to defer to her because she's claiming expertise here. She's worked in the medical field. She's been trained in the medical field, and he works on a fishing boat. He's rendered kind of helpless here. At the time, you have to remember, he's 17, he's overwhelmed with a baby, now a sick baby, and he's got a woman that's older than him with training. He's deferring to her. Look at it through his eyes. It's not so hard to understand. The first issue that she said she had, it was the sleep apnea. And later on, before she was five, she started talking about her having problems uh, with her eyes. She was having seizures and her digestive system. She had trouble, you know, the digesting certain foods. So the next major thing, you know, was the, uh, was the feeding tube she had, had put in her. Don't know how that got past the doctors, but she was persistent that she have a feeding tube put in. Did you hear what Rod just said? He didn't know how Dee Dee got the feeding tube insertion past the doctors. Well, let me comment on that for a minute here. Rod disagreed that Gypsy needed a feeding tube. Dee Dee thought she did. Rod disagreed with it. But again, he deferred to Dee Dee. And he's saying, how did she get this past a doctor? Well, the doctor disagreed with Dee Dee. It's just that simple. and. Let's face it, when you're dealing with children, you rely very heavily on the parent to be a reliable historian. You rely very heavily on the parent to report what's going on when they're home with the child. And if a parent shows up with a child that is emaciated or underweight, dehydrated, along with a report that the child cannot keep anything down and is unable to ingest food regularly, normally. And you have evidence there that the child is below weight, according to the charts, and is dehydrated. It makes sense. If you are relating the symptomatology to the physicians and they are believed, why wouldn't a doctor do a procedure? There was indications for it there. So that's how the decision was made to give a feeding tube. He just disagreed with it. Now, we'll talk later about whether that was the right thing to do or not, but 2020 hindsight, he feels like it was the wrong decision. One thing I do know 
is that living on a feeding tube for a child is a very difficult thing. The tube has to be fitted and changed at least every six months, which can be very uncomfortable for the child. You have an opening there that is subject to infection. There are all kinds of problems with this, so it is not something that a physician would do lightly or that they would do without having some good clinical evidence as well as a responsible parent giving them some history. I started wondering what kind of issues she has. You know, she's had seizures, she's got sleep apnea, she's got digestive problems, and, and Dee Dee always told me she had some issues growing up. I thought it might have been genetic. But one of the reasons that Rod was so bothered by all of this, and I think it's another red flag, another link in the chain that he failed to react to, is that despite what Dee Dee was telling him, about Gypsy being sickly, he says every time he saw Gypsy, she seemed to be fine. Whenever he visited her, she seemed to be feeling well, she seemed to be robust. But Rod and everyone in the family just hoped that Gypsy would grow out of her myriad of illnesses. She, he just felt like, okay, you know, children have childhood diseases, maybe she'll grow out of this. So part of this maybe is denial and part of it is just hoping against hope that I don't really know what to do here, so I'm just going to hope that maybe this will get better with time. But Rod says not to be. That Gypsy's health only got worse as she got older. When Gypsy was seven years old, she was in a minor motorcycle accident with her grandfather. When I say minor, she skinned her knee. Not a big deal for a youngster, right? Happens all the time. But after a visit to the doctor, that minor accident suddenly turned into a major ailment. Rod says Dee Dee told him the diagnosis was much more serious than just a cut, bruise, and a scrape. Dee Dee said Gypsy's legs were failing, so she needed a walker to get around and ultimately a wheelchair. Five, six seven years old. At the same time, she started having problems with, with her physical ability to use her legs. Her muscles would hurt her. Dee Dee told me she had muscular dystrophy. She was gonna lose her ability to walk pretty soon. Muscular dystrophy? Muscular dystrophy from a skinned knee? Who has ever heard of that happening? But Dee Dee insisted that crippling disease is exactly what Gypsy had and that it was incurable. She would talk a lot about her muscular dystrophy and her seizures and everything. When we would talk on the phone, and that's when I kind of started asking Dee Dee, what's, what's going on? Can they figure out what's the problem? She told me she had a chromosome disorder. Dee Dee said she wasn't going to live to be 20 years old. So she has this chromosome disorder, which is going to affect all of her functions. She would never get like full grown. Uh, and her mental capacity would be reduced. Gypsy, growing up, she seemed a normal, happy child, uh, apart from the ailments her mom said she had. To me, she, I had never seen her display any symptoms of, you know, I never seen her have a seizure or throw up from eating any certain types of foods or anything. She just seemed like any other child. She seemed very normal, active, happy. Normal was not in the cards for Gypsy Rose. The deck was already stacked against her. Rod says when Gypsy and Dee Dee moved north to Springfield after the hurricane, she told him Gypsy's health really started going south. At that point, she's telling me she's got cancer. She's shaving her head, taking pictures uh, of both of them shaving their heads. So that was pretty elaborate to go from chromosome disorder, now she's got cancer. I couldn't fathom that the chromosome disorder had anything to do with cancer. Really? Like it hadn't already? No, it really took a turn for the worse. A hurricane, epileptic seizures, a feeding tube, muscular dystrophy, and now cancer? Dee Dee said it was leukemia. How could this sweet, inseparable mother-daughter pair have such a run of bad luck? It just seems unfathomable, unfair, and unending. So the good people of Springfield got together and changed the bad luck into good. They rallied around their new neighbors. They surprised them with nothing less than a custom-built home. It was built with special wheelchair modifications for her daughter. The house was heaven-sent. And those wheelchair ramps? 
a godsend. Dee Dee was ecstatic about the wheelchair ramps. She told her new neighbors that the muscular dystrophy had damaged Gypsy's spindly legs so much that she was now paralyzed below the waist. Now, once they had settled into their new home, Dee Dee reinvented herself. Even though by this time she and Rod were long divorced, she kept her married name, but she added the letter E to Blanchard. That final E put sort of a classy French patina on it because now it's not pronounced Blanchard, it's now Blanchard. Kind of makes you wonder, what's that all about? Why would Dee Dee feel the need to reinvent herself? Is this an alias? Is she hiding? Has she been kiting paper, bouncing checks around? Dee Dee also told everyone that Gypsy had a learning disability, and as a result of her premature birth, she claimed Gypsy had microcephaly. That's a very rare condition in which the baby's head and brain development is smaller than normal. The unborn child doesn't get enough oxygen to allow the brain to fully develop, and it can cause the child to become mentally challenged. As a result, Dee Dee says Gypsy never made it past second grade, and she told everyone, including Gypsy, that she had the mental age of a six- or seven-year-old, even though by now she was a teenager. But Dee Dee homeschooled Gypsy, so it was okay. She would move at her own pace. And she says Gypsy learned how to read from the Harry Potter books. Now, time out here for a minute. To put on the developmental psychology hat here, I don't know if you've read any Harry Potter books, but they're pretty complex books. Pretty well thought out. They're very layered. They're very complex. A lot of characters. There's a complete fantasy world that's created. It's kind of a leap because here's a teen who's supposedly educated at only a second grade level with a mental age of six or seven who's learning to read by Harry Potter books. This kind of jumps out to me as being incongruent with someone that has a mental age of six or seven. The numbers of words in the sentences, the complexity of the plot lines, it just seems that the books are pretty difficult for someone with a mental age of just six or seven. Is Gypsy Rose perhaps a whole lot smarter than her mother is telling her she is? And are we dealing here with another accident enabling factor? People failing to take note of a significant incongruency. By incongruency, I mean a report that a six or seven year old mental age individual is learning to read from more complex books than make sense. But when Gypsy spoke to the local news about her new house, her childlike voice, and her kind of Pollyannish attitude certainly seemed to validate her mom's claim that she had the mental age of a child. It just proves that happy endings are not just in fairy tales, they're real. In addition, to learning to read from Harry Potter books, she was also enamored with Disney characters. Gypsy was living a life where she lived vicariously through fairy tales. She seemed to escape into the happy endings and the, the wonder of the Disney world, the magic of Harry Potter. These seemed to be escape mechanisms for her. She had a particular affinity for Cinderella. Tragically, her own fractured life certainly seemed to be headed towards anything but a happy ending. You know, it all sounds so horrible. Try to put yourself in Gypsy's shoes. Imagine what she's dealing with, what's going through her mind. She's confined to a wheelchair. She's unable to walk. She's fighting cancer. She's losing her beautiful brown hair from chemo. Rod says he felt powerless to do anything to help his daughter other than giving her constant encouragement. You know, he says he trusted Dee Dee's medical knowledge and her assessments of Gypsy's condition because of her training in nursing school. She did a little college and she had a little medical background, so she had some books we found in the house, leukemia for dummies and you know, different books like that, so she did her research. 
And more importantly, Gypsy implicitly trusted her mom, and she lived by the phrase, Mother Knows Best. Always doing what her mom asked her to do, never challenging, always remaining courageous as she faced her mounting illnesses head on. I questioned Didi, what's going on? She can walk or not? You know, she's gonna be in a wheelchair all her life. And the answer I got from Didi was she had a disease and it was gonna progressively get worse and eventually she was gonna be bound to the wheelchair at all times. And that's when I kind of started asking Didi, what's going on? Didi said she wasn't gonna live to be 20 years old. The way Rod says Didi described it, it sounded like a death sentence for young Gypsy Rose. That had to be shocking news for everyone in the family. Here's Gypsy's stepmom, Christy. Her Mickey button, the leukemia, we didn't think that she would live a long life and everything. I mean, chromosomes missing, and there was so much when people would ask me, oh, what Gypsy has wrong with her? I'm like, uh, the list is shorter of what she doesn't have. That's pretty much how we kind of explain it. Pretty much doesn't even begin to cover the universe of Gypsy's ailments. Christy says Dee Dee told her that Gypsy was drooling all the time. She was producing too much saliva and required surgery to remove her salivary glands. Dee Dee had told me that she had problems with her salivary glands, that from one of her seizures that it made her get paralyzed from mid-thigh down. A surgery for her acid reflux, saying that she had to get part of her stomach lining wrapped around her esophagus. Salivary gland surgery and the removal of the stomach lining are two very painful and invasive procedures. And it's hard to imagine how much Gypsy was suffering. At this point, Dee Dee told everyone that Gypsy's health had declined to the extent that she was forced to quit her nursing job. She said Gypsy required around-the-clock care. And who better to give her that care than her own mother. Dee Dee became super mom, always protecting and nurturing her daughter, and everyone in Springfield admired her for her tenacity, for her dedication. But without a steady paycheck, how would they survive? Well, they relied on government assistance that paid for a closet full of medicines, multiple surgeries, and charity that included donations and even free trips to Disney World. They spent a lot of time planning and doing things, you know, taking trips to Disney World and different events. They would have free trips here and there, free flights. She was getting some money from a couple of celebrities she had, she had met, so their life was full of free stuff, fun stuff that they were able to take advantage of, piggybacking on her medical condition. Country music star Miranda Lambert reportedly met Gypsy backstage at a concert and donated several thousand dollars. Not to mention the tens of thousands of dollars many Good Samaritans kicked in as well. She'd done so many concerts and meet and greets just because that's what they do to make a wish foundations and everything. You know, they look out for kids that are disabled and everything. So she took advantage of that to the extreme. That on top of the whole support system from the medical field, just the welfare side of Missouri, it's a big state for welfare and helping people out. So she really took advantage of a lot of that. Rod says he regrets he wasn't always there for Gypsy in the early years. Even though he abandoned his family at the beginning, he says he always paid his child support on time and even threw in extra cash along the way to help pay for Gypsy's mounting medical bills. For the first five years of Gypsy's life, I've never lived with Dee Dee and Gypsy. You have a child and you live with them and you, you go through so much with them, you, be, you build this tight bond with them. And you know, that's one thing that we, we never did get to experience that, uh, Gypsy and I. Dee Dee was always there in the middle, making sure that didn't happen. She was just that buffer and it was very limited. I did the best I could. Birthdays, holidays, but it, it was always hard. In her first five years, they lived here locally, not far, so we did some visits. It wasn't until she was, you know, after five, six years old, they, they started moving further and further away and the visits became more scarce. We always stayed in communication, you know, phone calls and everything. The, with the physical visits, the further Dee Dee moved away, the, the less we got to spend time with her. Rod says on those phone calls, he always tried to give Gypsy the emotional support she needed. But what words can a father say to his little girl who's paralyzed, who may never walk again, 
and frankly, who may not live long enough to see 21 candles on her birthday cake. He said he did his best to make her feel loved and wanted. She seemed pretty happy when I would talk to her about, you know, would call her and, hey, what y'all been up to? And, you know, she'd tell me about a little trip they did or something they took part in, and she was always pretty cheery about, about everything they've done and, and what they were going to plan on doing, so it seemed pretty normal. A lot of times I would ask her how she's feeling. She said she was feeling okay, you know, she was just a little tired. A lot of times her response would be, you know, she's just tired and not feeling too wonderful, but not too, too bad. Rod says he worried endlessly about Gypsy, but in the final analysis, he relied on Dee Dee's medical knowledge. He believed everything she told him and remained in awe of how she handled everything as the sole caregiver. Oh, absolutely, no doubt. I would tell Dee Dee all the time, I don't know how you do it. I could never do it. That's why I continued to support her financially, even after she turned 18. Kept supporting them and trying to do all I can for them. So I was grateful. I told Dee Dee all the time, you're a great mom. I don't know how you do it. I could never do it. Gypsy's childhood, you know, as far as we can tell, she seemed like Dee Dee had her best interests. Christy agrees, but she says Dee Dee was reluctant to allow her and her children to forge a good relationship with Gypsy. I tried to have a relationship with Gypsy as best as I could. She called me Aunt Christy. My kids call Dee Dee Aunt Dee Dee. I don't think Dee Dee would have wanted her calling me mom number two or stepmom. It was kind of hard to get that relationship that I wanted. Dee Dee made it impossible. I'd speak to Gypsy a couple of times every few months. So we never knew that she was in the hospital or that she was sick until after the fact. I would get on the phone and ask her how she was doing, and she would tell me everything's going good. I'm tired, or I've been sick, but I'm, I'm okay now. And around the holidays, you know, or her birthday or anything, we, you know, I'd call her and, you know, ask her what she wanted, you know, for Christmas. And she would tell me nothing but love. I mean, you ask any kid, you know, what you want. They naming 10 things, you know, off the back of their hand. And, she would tell me, you know, nothing but love. So Christy says she always kept her promise, giving Gypsy buckets of unconditional love. But she says things got a little awkward when Dee Dee asked for something extra. Dee Dee would call the next day or something and say, well, she wants this or she wants this. You know, so we would order it and, and mail it to her and thinking that she would know it was from us, but Dee Dee would tell her, look what mom got you. What's that all about? The mom taking credit for a present from the stepmom? It almost sounds like Dee Dee is treating Gypsy as a cash cow. Well, Christy was Rod's second wife, after all, and she says there was a bit of underlying tension between them. But despite that troublesome family dynamic between mom and stepmother, Christy says she never questioned Dee Dee's total devotion to Gypsy and was impressed with her encyclopedic knowledge of Gypsy's diseases. Well, as Dee Dee working in the medical field, no matter where you work, you pick up things, you learn things. And I just basically thought she had it, this is the reason, this is why it happened, this is the treatment, this is what we're doing, this is the doctor. Everything was backed up and we never like, question it. We thought, great mom, taking care of Gypsy. I told Rod so many times, like, I don't know how, how she does it. You know, I mean, putting all that time and effort into Gypsy. I basically praised her, thinking Dee Dee was doing this great job with Gypsy. She was always, as a mom would be, giving Gypsy the attention, the love, the care that a normal mom would. Never saw red flags. Now, as you heard, Rod red flags were already flying in the wind and he says when he called Gypsy on her 18th birthday the biggest red flag of them all. Gypsy really didn't know her age. I called her for her 18th birthday and Dee Dee didn't want me to talk to her. Well she, she wanted me to tell her happy birthday but she didn't want me to tell her happy 18th birthday. So she was, I was like why not you know it's her 18th birthday. It's, it's a big day, you know? It's like, well, she don't really know that she's 18. I thought that was weird. I thought it was just mind blown to, to think that she would not want her to know that she's 18. That starts Rod's mind working overtime. He wonders why Dee Dee is always isolating Gypsy from everyone. Why is she sometimes reluctant to let him talk to his own daughter? 
you know, I call and say, where's Gypsy? And I talk to her and say, well, she's taking a nap. Uh, call back in an hour, I'll have her ready for you. So, you know, I'd call back in an hour, I'll call back the next day at a certain time. And, you know, she'd be ready there with all the right answers. And apparently the isolation wasn't directed only toward Rod and Christy. It was to everyone Gypsy came in contact with. Now, this is important because you have to understand isolation is the number one tool of the abuser. But why was she doing it? Was it because she was being abusive or was it that she was just being overprotective of a very fragile young child? Or are there more evil reasons? Either way, Dee Dee never left Gypsy alone in a room with others. She constantly held her hand, always clutching it tightly, very tightly almost like an iron grip grasping her tiny fingers. Dee Dee wouldn't let Gypsy visit her best friend Aaliyah Woodman see. She wouldn't even let her see her alone and insisted that she had to chaperone them. Even though Aaliyah only lived next door, Aaliyah said she never objected to Dee Dee's constant hovering and clinging of Gypsy. She says she was just happy to give her friend the support she needed. Sweet, loving, caring, just full of life and happiness. Now, investigators interviewed Aaliyah after the murder. The information she provides them will help detectives unlock the mystery. She will help them find who committed this crime. And she'll also help figure out why. The murder of Dee Dee Blanchard has police stumped. Who killed her? Why would the killer stab someone they didn't know 17 times and then kidnap a intellectually challenged, chronically ill, paralyzed daughter? That day is difficult for Rod and Christy to even talk about. But they bravely tell us about the horrifying moment when they heard about Dee Dee's murder and Gypsy's apparent abduction. When I heard Dee Dee got murdered, I was at work. Her sister called me, said, you heard about Dee Dee and Gypsy? I said, no, what's going on? And she started crying. She said, uh, Gypsy was missing and, and Dee Dee was murdered. And I was like, really? I couldn't believe it. I've got a call a couple times from them. They had, they've been through some things. They got robbed at the store. This was like serious. Somebody was dead. Oh, it seems like yesterday. Rod was at work and he had called like he always does. Cheerful conversation about an hour later. He calls again, and I'm like, okay, this is not, you know, this is out of the norm. And all I could hear was him crying and saying, Dee Dee's dead, and they can't find Gypsy. And I was like, what? And he's like, Dee Dee's dead, and they can't find Gypsy. And first thing that came to my mind was, oh my God, somebody took her, and they're gonna leave her for dead, thinking that she can't walk. Sorry thinking that she can't walk and she needs all this medication. Rod says he's fearing the worst, that Gypsy's captors are doing God knows what to her. I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody murder somebody, even if they knew him or didn't know him? You murder somebody and you take a handicapped person as a, as a hostage or a victim or, or whatever, it didn't make sense. It's not something you hear about every day, you know, when you hear about people getting kidnapped and this and that. But, you don't hear too many handicapped people getting kidnapped. Police think Gypsy may still be alive somewhere and that the killer may have forced her to give up the password to her Facebook page. Now, the detectives trace the IP address of the mysterious person who wrote the disgusting Facebook post that he killed Dee Dee and raped Gypsy. It came from a computer nearly 600 miles away in Big Ben, Wisconsin. Wisconsin? Who in Wisconsin would even know Gypsy Rose and Dee Dee? Is that where the killer is holding Gypsy captive? Coming up in episode two, the search for Gypsy goes national. Startling new developments in an already bizarre murder case in Springfield. Where is Gypsy? Is she dead or is she alive? Is she tied up, held captive in the squalid basement? What's the connection to Wisconsin? Remember in the beginning, I said this killer was not from Springfield. 
this killer traveled a long way not to commit a random crime but to kill this specific woman why Shocking discoveries are just around the corner. And the sheriff reveals one of them. A lot of times we're deceived, and I think this might be the case. We'll separate the facts from the fabrication. That's all coming up in the next episode of The Killer Thorn of Gypsy Rose. Analysis of murder by Dr. Phil. I'm Dr. Phil McGraw. Thanks for listening.